Uh, may I request Mr. Faraz Pandukta to please uh, begin with the recitation of the Holy Quran? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خير um, on behalf of CFSID Pakistan the board of CFSID Pakistan and the president Mr. Sajjad Anwar I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, seminar on exploring global trends in the um, trends in the global financial industry the speaker with us here today is very familiar to the industry Mr. Zaheer Uddin Khalid who is who was previously with um, the MD and the head of asset management at Jadwa Investments. And he just told me that, you know, he's been part of the CFA Society, although being in Saudi Arabia, so we appreciate him uh, being part of us. And uh, before I invite him to um, carry on with his uh, speech, I wanted to let you know that we also wanted to celebrate all those who had participated in our mentorship program. Uh, some of the mentors and mentees are here, so after um, the session we'll uh, do an exchange of a, a token of appreciation to them as well. So, um, Zaheer Sab, over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Yes, Assalamu alaikum everyone. So, uh, how many are okay with Urdu? Everyone? Okay. <coughs> so, um, I, I was telling Ruksana, uh, this, is, this is better. I was telling Ruksana that I, I requested Sarvat that. Uh, uh, can I have a topic that I have prepared for in, 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 in before and that will be easy for me and that would have been about asset management as you know that my career is mostly uh, asset management in Pakistan and outside of Pakistan. So, uh, but uh, Tharwa said that focus on something which is uh, more uh, as a wider appeal so then we chose this topic of uh, trends in global financial industry, uh, but that's just the topic. We'll talk about asset management. So, um, so we'll, we'll we'll start off a little bit on on banking. So, uh, uh, of course, there are many trends that are taking place right now, and and uh, you can uh, uh, you know if 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 you have just a session on key trends on banking, you can go for hours on, on, on that. Uh, but here I've focused on mainly things which are related to technology and, and how disruption is taking place and what are the trends there. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about uh, introduction of challenger banks or neo banks. These are digital banks that are coming up across uh, in, in different markets. Pakistan can there be, as we know, uh, digital banking license ka process chal raha tha. I don't know where, where it stands today, but um, uh, that's an area. Uh, another interesting area is open banking, and um, it's, it's a relatively new concept. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, then what are the implications for the incumbent banks, the traditional banks, and, and what are they doing? And then, uh, you know, some competition that is coming through from non-banking players into the banking industry. Um, so let's, let's start off with uh, talking about neo-banks. Um, so this, uh, over the last, I would say, seven, eight years, a major change is, 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 uh, is happening, uh, mostly in, all of the, a lot of that is happening in UK, but also in US and Europe. Uh, where uh, you know new banks, digital banks are coming up, and and they're um, you know uh, really uh, developing very fast and and, and taking up market share. Um, a cons uh, you know a general concept has been, and you know uh, frankly speaking, I had a similar view 
that digital banking is is probably more relevant in areas where there is a large population that is unbanked so that's why people think think about uh, emerging markets people think about uh, africa that uh, you know uh, those areas digital banks are doing well and and that is the case but here we will uh, mostly talk about banks which are um, operating in developed markets and and despite being in in very very strong um, uh, banking markets they're able to do very well um, so some of the names that you see here v bank is in china revolut uh, is is in uk monzo also uk uh, n26 i believe is in germany and, and few others so uh, what what do they do they typically have uh, lower fees on on banking products they typically focus on um, uh, payments, currency trans uh, conversions, transfers cro across border. Uh, that's where most of the digital banks or neo banks have started off from. But now they are moving into you know, the, the normal markets and, and that's where uh, you're seeing tough competition for, um, uh, for, for, the, for the traditional banks. Um, and they, you know, what's their, why, why do they get a lot of uh, um, interest from, uh, from the public? Because they have a digital first strategy. So they are, they are focusing on um, uh, client acquisition through easy onboarding process. Pakistan, I have been doing some days account. We have done some phrases and mirrors. When we run a company, we have tried to open our account. Uh, it's, it's been two weeks. Uh, similarly, I wanted to open my mother bank account and now it's been two weeks. The process is, 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 is lengthy, but when you go uh, to these banks, this is a five-minute process. You open a bank account um, and mind you, in markets which are much more stringent in terms of regulations than, than Pakistan. Uh, so this is unki ek sort of uh, key to success hoti hai, uh, of digital banks that they can do so processes. Kar lete Aur of course, they appeal to a younger uh, generation. Ko zyada appeal karte in Pakistan, there is an example hai. Um, Of course, it's, it's not really a banking, banking entity right now, but you see that they are focused on younger generation and you see younger generation many you know my younger cousins only have a bank account in Sadape. Uh, and and that's what's happening in these developed markets as well where uh, a lot of people now only have bank accounts in in these places so uh, as these younger generation people become older and uh, the old ones like us die uh, you know the the traditional customers of traditional banks will no longer be there. So I think that a, a longer term journey uh, definitely uh, is there for, for these type of banks. Something interesting, I was, when I was searching for this, uh, uh, for, for this presentation, um, I came across this data. This is the number of users in millions of uh, these digital banks. Uh, this data uh, excludes China. Uh, China itself has 300 million plus digital bank customers. And uh, right now, excluding China, we are close to 250 million customers uh, globally. So we are talking about uh, 250 million is roughly 3% of global population and another 3% from coming from China. So already six odd percent of global population, global population has a digital bank, right, a digital bank account right now. So, and, and the growths that are seeing, you can see the numbers, uh, it's, it's north of 50%. Uh, so change is happening at a very, very fast pace. Uh, and if, uh, you know, the incumbent banks do not uh, do uh, something about it, they will be left behind. And, and you will see that, you know, uh, in our lifetimes we've seen, you know, I bought my first mobile phone when I was 23. 
uh, which was 20 years ago uh, or yeah something around that uh, that that was after working one year in, uh, after IBA um, and that was a Nokia now no one has that Nokia uh, now that market is completely wiped off uh, if you see in terms of you know in terms of numbers so uh, we've seen in our in in our uh, lifetime that you know traditional phones then mobile phones which were not smart phones and now to smartphones and now you know i don't know if, how many of you have seen the vr's headset from apple so you know the technology pace is significant and industries can completely get wiped out if they they do not make those changes so now another area on on the banking side and related to technology is is open banking um, how many of us are familiar with open banking if anyone so this is a relatively new concept again interestingly a, a lot of these changes are are being pioneered and and uh, aggressively being deployed in uk um, uh, both in case of digital banks and, and in open banking. So what open banking does is uh, once the central bank uh, introduces open banking in a country, they force the banks that they need to open up customer data to these open banking licensed players. So for example, um, a fintech will come which will have a, a open banking license and it will go to if if this was introduced in 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 pakistan will go to hbl and say um, i have the open banking license i will connect with you and i will get all your customer data with free of cost now in this world age where um, uh, data has the most value these organizations are getting free data and this is not just information about customers it is information about their transactions so the type of usage that typically you know these open banking entities are starting off with are uh, you know, budgeting uh, apps or um, you know helping people uh, see where they're spending which areas they're spending in etc etc uh, but then at a later stage there can be things like imagine if, if you have four bank accounts and uh, you have on top of that an open banking app you will see a consolidated picture of your finances you see where you're spending of course you know that has insights etc um, that on that basis you can for example uh, you have a credit card payment coming up tonight on 14th of June and you have money in another bank account press of a button you move that money so that your bank account uh, your credit card payment gets uh, gets paid and you don't get charged interest uh, so these type of uh, things can come up there can be um, you know selling of products so if a bank has information another area of open banking is on uh, from a credit review perspective where um, because the open banking entity has complete information of your finances unlike a bank where you go and uh, it just you you have your salary being transferred there those places are not able to do complete uh, understanding of your credit credit situation versus this type of player which has a complete uh, oversight of, of your areas so these are some of the things which are which are coming there so um, this is an interesting uh, area which is uh, which is developing um, just to give you a sense of the scale 2018 was the first year when open banking was introduced uh, the, the full one full year of, of operations of open banking in UK and at that time there were uh, in one year 60 million API calls took place in one year in 2022 there were six billion API calls that took place and this is with only five percent of the banking population currently adopting uh, open banking 
So imagine the scale that will come through with this and the type of data that will be available to these apps and, and what they can do. I've, I've put in two uh, companies from, uh, from the MENA region here as well, Lean Technologies and Tarabat. Uh, both of them, uh, they started operations in, uh, in, in the Middle East three to four years ago. Um, both are, uh, have license with uh, Sama, which is the Saudi Central Bank and one of them has a, a license with uh, the Bahraini uh, Central Bank. Both of them have a valuation today of $200 million. And this is at a time when VC funding is, is, is tight. After all of this crash that has happened on the VC side, I don't know if, if, you're, if you're following what's happening on VC side, a lot of companies have been wiped out. Even after that, these companies have a valuation of $200 million each. So that, that, that's a, a major, major area which is, which is developing. <coughs> so what, what does it mean for, um, uh, for your traditional banks? So given the success that is happening on uh, the traditional banking side and on the open banking side and, and on the new banking side, the traditional banks are, are now you know, really feeling the pain and, and you know, moving towards uh, digitization. Now, the areas that uh, they are focusing on um, are, of course, customer-facing tasks need to be um, addressed so that they are done uh, quickly, fast, and, and, and in an efficient manner so that this issue that, you know, that we are facing in opening bank accounts of, of two to weeks does not happen and it's done quickly. We are seeing some of that already, and, and Pakistan is an example where, uh, where now some a development has happened, you know, in the industry that we are, uh, at least I am from, in the asset management industry, digital account opening is there. Uh, some uh, banking apps are also, you know, uh, coming up and, and, and doing well. So, uh, but I think there is a lot that can be done there. And, and the institutions that do not address these things will, will really uh, feel the pain. Then, of course, the other area where, you know, uh, banks, because, look, new, new banks or open banking entities are only getting data and they're working on those now. The traditional banks have been in operation for, you know, decades. So they have, the, the amount of data that they have is, of course, phenomenal. So uh, someone who is able to deploy uh, technology on that data is able to understand consumer behavior and 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 they are able to then understand on on what type of uh, uh, you know what type of product can be uh, offered to what type of clients and, and and things like that and then of course use of AI on uh, customer service related stuff uh, I don't know if if you've in, you've seen in some places already uh, the chatbots that you chat with are not computers, uh, are not humans, they are AI generated chatbots already deployed in Pakistan and of course in, in, in other markets. Uh, and then of course uh, technology tools to use, KYC, AML, that's uh, it's a whole you know, huge area where uh, regulation tech, reg tech is, is, is a big field uh, altogether. Um, now, what we're seeing, uh, uh, especially in the Middle East and, and also in, in some areas in, in, in the West, uh, that traditional banks tend to take one of two approaches when they're, um, you know, uh, to, to address the digital uh, onslaught that is coming through. Uh, one is uh, they create a digital bank of their own or a complete separate digital brand. So KFH, Kuwait Finance House, which is the se uh, second largest Islamic bank in the world after Raji Bank, uh, is, has a uh, digital bank of their own called Jazeel. Uh, Gulf, Islam, uh, Gulf Investment Bank has uh, another uh, similar uh, approach where they, they have a separate digital bank called Meme. Uh, these are both in, in, in the Middle East. Or the other approach is that one or some of their products are completely digital. So, for example, if uh, uh, someone can digitize the uh, small account opening process, so uh, for a certain size customer, 
you can you'll have a complete digital journey only you will not have a physical journey at all so some of these things are, are being uh, being deployed as well now the other interesting area is you know the the entry of non banking players in the banking space um, now interestingly few months back apple uh, started offering bank deposits so you can now transfer money from your credit card or your bank account into your apple pay account they will give you in usd 4.15% return on your deposit they have a ability to have a, a a sort of a cash sweep from if you link your accounts it will go into apple pay and they will give you that 4% uh, return 4% in us in dollar terms is a very very high rate typical just to give you sense the typical bank you know, savings rate is uh, under 1% so it's it's 40 50 basis points so this is a classified as a high yield uh, deposit and that's now a player like apple who that has you know complete trust they they have more information about us than maybe we have about ourselves uh, and and they are offering this so you will see a big change where a lot of people will start moving money to these uh, these type of banks so you know in in our in our area where you know wealth management or asset management uh, if you go to people and talk to clients in pakistan they think of bank deposits as a saving option it's it's a transaction play it's not a saving option uh, and these type of things will will take away those deposits and stuff that that we are seeing in in, in banks uh, the other thing which is happening is um, on the you know this is on the deposit side and and then another thing on the borrowing lending side where uh, a lot of retailers have gone into consumer financing uh so there there players in in saudi you know um, which extra is a, is a retailer of white goods uh, and and electronic appliances etc they've been doing uh, financing of of those products for retail customers for the last 4 5 years um similarly tamara imkan are, are similar players uh, klarna which is a uh, which is a large bnpl player out of europe out of sweden um, infamous for a, a big decline in the in the valuation i think they they lost probably 80% of their valuation uh, when when the vc bubble burst few few months back but they are in the space of bnpl which is buy now play pay later so a lot of customers which would have been a credit card customer of banks uh and and would have been buying stuff on credit from banks are now moving to these players and and benefiting from uh, you know uh, borrowing from them now to the area of um, uh, asset management so few things which are happening in here because i i know a little bit more than banking i have focused on on operational stuff rather than technology uh so uh pressure on fees you know that that's been happening uh, for for the longest of time um there's an increased focus on illiquid asset classes and this is an area of of major interest for me and and i think it has major implications for for uh, the industry in pakistan in my opinion uh, introduction of similarly introduction of new asset classes then the concept which uh, you know uh, we've learned over over the years difference between a wealth manager and an asset manager and we'll talk about a bit on that and then some technology related stuff we will see uh, on fees this is um in in developed markets uh, fees have been going down forever this is since 1996 so almost uh, talking about almost three decades fees have been going down secularly uh, across asset classes so equities 
uh, mixed asset classes or multi-asset or bond and money market, everything has gone down. Uh, and uh, that that is an area where you know uh, we see as the industry matures, this trend you see in every market. Um, so why why is that? Because one is that, um, of course, because asset management in good markets is a very lucrative business, a lot of players start coming in, so competition brings that down. And then also you see uh, as markets start becoming more efficient, it becomes very, very difficult to outperform the market. And when you are underperforming the market, the, manage, uh, the client says, why should I pay you fees if you're, if you're unable to beat the market? So that, that, uh, those are the reasons which are, uh, which are putting pressure on, uh, on fees uh, and hence the revenues for the asset management industry. But having said that, managers with strong track record or if they have a, um, a strategy which is a unique strategy, which uh, makes money different from from rest of the market. So if it's an absolute return strategy or we talk about hedge funds, etc., they are still able to, uh, you know, uh, get good fees and able to maintain fees. And, and we've seen in, uh, in, in our experience where, um, you know, the, the organization that I was with um, for the last 15 years in Saudi, we were able to actually not just uh, keep our fees, we were able to add on top of our management fees a performance fee component which is linked to profitability. So, uh, and, and, that, and that was in public equity. So, because, because this track record is very strong. So, that, 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 is, that is an exception. And I think that's an important thought. We'll, we'll come to that uh, in, in one of the next slides. Illiquid asset classes. I think that's a that's a major area where um, I feel that uh, the uh, the industry uh, here in in Pakistan has has probably not uh, focused on or has not developed a lot on. So we've we've just focused on um, the traditional asset classes, public equity, uh, fixed income, and and money market, and even the new products that we do are a combination or variation of those asset classes, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so what is the concept behind this higher allocation to illiquid asset classes? You know, as we know, portfolio theory says that as, uh, that, that if you don't have liquidity, then that investment should have a illiquidity premium. So the returns that you will generate from an illiquid investments, everything held constant, should be higher than a liquid investments. And that, that's the focus, of, that, that's the premise on which um, if you have a long enough investment horizon that you can bear the illiquidity, then it makes more sense to invest in illiquid asset classes than in liquid asset classes. And as a result, you know, the university endowments in the US are considered the, the most sort of cutting edge in terms of uh, asset owners, people who, institutional investors who invest. And these are some interesting numbers that you know, uh, we've seen. Harvard endowment, Harvard University's endowment, $50 billion in size, has allocation to private equity. This, by the way, private equity is one of the illiquid asset classes, 37%. Yale Endowment, 43 billion in size, also 38%. Princeton, similarly, 35 billion in size, 44% in, in, in private equity. Anyone can guess what is the total allocation to illiquid and alternative asset classes for Harvard Endowment? Any guesses? 75%. 75% of Harvard is an endowment, which is considered a very, very sophisticated investor, is in illiquid asset classes and alternate asset classes. In public equity, in fixed income, in money market, they have 25%. 
So this is where the more the most sophisticated institutional investors are going. Unfortunately, uh, you know, in our markets, people think that the right way, right thing to do is just put money in the bank account, and you know that that's that's the right thing to do. Uh, but you know, that people in 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 developed markets are thinking very very differently. So as as a result of this, because this all all of this sort of uh, thing started with uh, you know in the early 2000s uh, and this move has moved towards and, and part of that was because in the 90s uh, the private equity was booming and they, they saw good returns and then the institution investors started thinking about this and they started allocating and then non-endowment institution investors have also started focusing a lot on that now typically typical asset allocation in institutions you see uh, 30, 40 percent in illiquid asset classes and alternate asset classes. So as a result, now managers are, have started focusing on making those products. And all of this gets sort of connected because in traditional asset classes, your fees are going down. Uh, you have, of course, the size on traditional asset classes typically is always larger. but if you make 50 basis points on your uh, traditional asset class and on your alternate asset classes you make 2%, so one-fourth of the size will also give you the same amount of returns. right? And, and the best part is once you raise that fund, it is locked, no one can redeem. So from an asset management perspective, it's, it's, it's a great uh, sort of revenue base for, for you to have. So that's why a lot of asset managers have, have focused on this and, and, and grown their illiquid and, and alternate asset classes. And you see that's why VC, private debt, uh, infrastructure, real assets. You know, I was, I, I was so pleased to see uh, the fund which HBL has done on, on livestock. I think that those are the type of things that we need to think about there. I mean, I've, I, we've not invested while I was in, in, in Saudi, but we've evaluated a manager that does timber. It's a fund that invests in forests. So there are funds which finance trade, trade finance. So there are very interesting things which, uh, you know, we can do and, and uh, think about as, as asset managers. <coughs> so this is the area which I was mentioning uh, is, of, uh, is of great interest for me. Uh, what is the difference between the wealth manager and an investment manager? And you see this developing now in many um, uh, you know, of the more sophisticated markets. Wealth manager is someone who focuses on client acquisition and how to get more out of the client and get a bigger share of their wallet. They are less concerned about how, you know, what is the best stock to pick, how do I generate best performance. They are focused, it's a sales organization. Typically these are large institutions, you know, think, you think about private banks and those type of institutions. And of course they would want that the product is that is internally managed, but if a client wants a product, and they don't have it on their rostrum, they will get it from outside. So third part, selling of third party products is a very, very common thing, which uh, uh, in, in many sort of emerging markets you don't see. Uh, as compared to this, the investment manager is someone who is focused on managing money. He's less concerned about getting clients. So, those organizations, these are not, we're not talking about individuals here, we're talking about organizations. These organizations are uh, typically small teams of, of fund managers and analysts who, who have, uh, you know, expertise in a certain strategy or a certain asset class. And by the way, these you could find, for example, US small cap manager, that's it. They only do U.S. small cap strategy. That's it. Nothing else. Uh, and and things like that. So they'll be they can be very niche managers, or they you can have a boutique which has 
five, six very, very niche strategies. They will only focus on managing the, that money and they are expert at, at outperforming their benchmarks, etc. They will have institutional clients, the likes of those that we saw, the endowments, etc. And then they will, if they want to have individual or non-institutional clients, they will go through these wealth managers. So you see distribution of products, and uh, we don't have to go very far for this. In UAE, it's a huge market of distribution. You go to every bank and they can, they will be selling, uh, DIB will be selling some, uh, someone else's product. They will not create their own asset management company and, and just uh, you know, start managing in-house. They will sell third-party products. And I think that's an area where um, uh, we need to think about and that's where you know, the market is moving and we, sh we, can, we can see uh, uh, some benefit from there. Other, other, uh, other uh, important trends that we've seen, of course, the introduction of technology, so the robo-advisory is there where you, know, you are combining different asset classes and then um, you know, uh, creating structures, so a, a well-diversified portfolio can be there. Now, a, an area where we've seen uh, now each one, each one of you who are, who are from the asset management industry have your multi-asset or asset allocation funds, which uses, or fund of funds, which uses your own products, right? But let's face it, no, you are probably not the best manager in each of those asset classes. So one approach is that you choose, take the best manager from each asset class and combine this together, right? I was shocked, I did this analysis recently in the Pakistan industry, I was shocked to see average, average differential in return between a, in equity funds over the last 11 years between a top quartile manager and a bottom quartile manager per annum is close to 10%. So choosing the right manager can create so much of value uh, for you. So I, th I think those are areas where, where I think uh, we need to think about digitization, again, processes and client journeys. I think this is a, uh, this is a pain point, I guess, for, for many of us. And uh, I think we, we need to think about those. Uh, blockchain is a big topic, but just the small thing that I'll say and some companies are doing an interesting job. Uh, I recently met this uh, fintech uh, DAO PropTech, which is doing blockchain-based real estate uh, investments. So what they do is they use the blockchain as a ledger for ownership tracking of, of the projects that they sell on their, on their uh, platform. So some interesting things that you can do on the blockchain side for registry of assets. So I'll guess uh, just conclude it with uh, where I think uh, some uh, lessons could be for uh, for our industry um, in in Pakistan. Uh, of course, technology infrastructure enhancement is a given. I think if any institution that does not do it will cease to exist in the next few years. I think the play, the competition is coming. Right now, the fintechs are very, very small, and many of them will not succeed. But if your traditional competitor becomes very, very strong in technology, you will also not succeed. So I think this needs to be uh, focused on. Um, I think product development and moving just out of traditional asset classes, this is, uh, I think, definitely needs to be done and uh, that I'll show you just one chart. Uh, actually, let, let's, let's show you that. So this is the share of money market income and equity funds uh, on the left hand side. So 2013, we are just under 90% these three asset classes and 2023, we're just under 90% in these three asset classes. The composition on the right hand side is the composition. So the composition has changed. 
So sometimes when market is doing stock market is doing well, we, we go to equities. Uh, now the interest rates are very high. Money market and income funds are, are the name of the game. That happens, but really very, very little has happened outside of these asset classes. And I think that's where the area is. And um, I think all the product development that has happened, most of it is also just combination of these things. So those, you know, the investment plans that we launch, the VPS that is there, it's all packaging of the same asset class. So what can we do to enhance new asset classes? And that's an area we need to think about. One last thought that I would uh, leave you with is, <clears throat> we have had, we've exported bankers, I think since the last 50 years, to Middle East, to, uh, to the West. Uh, we have exported portfolio managers, we have exported analyst we have a very good workforce we have a very talented workforce why is it that none of the organizations barring i think you know what you can probably say one or two banks who tried it no one has tried to go outside go outside you have examples of companies from egypt efg hermes i think many of you would know that is an egyptian company which is which now has presence all across GCC. They started off with brokerage. They are in brokerage. They are in asset management. They they do leasing. They have a bank also, at, I believe, in in Egypt, and they do most many of these operations across the region. So yes, they have advantage of Arabic speaking, etc. But if a company uh, based in Saudi can entrust someone from Pakistan to run their business, why can't the sponsors in Pakistan entrust those type of same people to set up businesses outside of Pakistan and, and, and grow there? And here I'm not talking about that we go and sell Pakistan equity funds or Pakistan money market funds to the diaspora there. No, that is, I think we are thinking too small there. We are, I'm talking about, you have the talent there, you, someone needs to invest, have the talent, hire some people locally, start an, a setup, build a track record, and, and you can grow there. I think the biggest asset managers in Pakistan would be making what, two, three hundred million, four hundred million rupees a year in bottom line. That's a million dollar. I can tell you there are a, a lot of managers in the region that make much more than that. Very small managers. So it is very much doable. What, what's required is for us and our sponsors to think out of the box and not just be content with it. Okay, you know, is Salman and Tinsu million Kamalia kafi hai. That's the last thing that I wanted to share with you. Open for any questions that you have. It's uh, very difficult to get out of the comfort zone over here, but that is the lowest priority right now. It's not the comfort zone. I think it's the uncertainty of the regulatory as well as the economic environment, which stops anybody and everybody from uh, innovation and for thinking out of the uh, box. Because we, we saw that what happened with the startups. Yes. I think they have been, uh, most of them have been wiped, wiped out and all of them were thinking about um, out of box. So um, EFG Hermas is um, a good example. But then um, just look at their model. Wherever they existed, there was a stability into the economy. There was a stability into the markets. And uh, these market managers were actually trying to maybe equal, uh, become equal to the developed markets. That cannot be said about the Pakistan. So until unless you have a stability in Pakistan, and all the indicators in Pakistan obviously have been towards a decline. 
and any talented wealth manager or investment managers would know that that when every indicator is uh, declining they won't be comfortable to think out of the box or think innovative i think that's just my comment if you want to add more to that i that would be awesome fair, fair, fair point fair point but my point is that you know many of us want to move out right similarly all of our sponsors employers want to have exposure outside right they want to have wealth outside they because of the troubles that you're facing here right so what i'm saying is that what is stopping and because uh, it's a uh, it's an organization close to my heart and my dear friend asad bhai is sitting here i will take the liberty of taking mizan's name what is stopping al mizan to spend one year's profitability and open a setup in difc and start to start building a team and a track record in those markets what is stopping mizan there i think that it is it is the think or or for that matter hbl or asim is sitting here mcb or you know uh, or imtiaz i i'll take everyone's name <laughs> so uh, js to try it right so so i think that that's that's the point that uh, it is for the reasons that you see that the difficulty that is we we are facing here it should be you should try to diversify outside yes it's it's money spent yes but i can tell you this set up setting up an office in difc is actually cheaper than opening up a, a asset man management company in pakistan and i have done those numbers personally pakistan requires you to have a million dollar almost in licensing fees there the requirement is to have 6 months of expenses that is it so the capital requirements in saudi the requirement is to have 6 months of cap expenses that is it so these are the these markets have lowered the barrier for entry and other players are coming and i think we as as a market are, are losing out on on opportunity that is there so ji da वेरी गुड प्रेजेंटेशन आई थिंक सर आपने वैसे तो ट्रेंड सारे सही बताए आई थिंक वन ऑफ द ट्रेंड्स विच आई फाउंड मिसिंग इवन दो यू एल्यूडेड टू इट वॉज द आज ही प्रेजेंटेशन बनाइए इसलिए मिसिंग है लेकिन बताए एक्टिव वर्सेज पैसिव का जो ट्रेंड है पूरा का पूरा ग्लोबली तो उस पर थोड़ा सा अगर आप शेड लाइन एक्टिव वर्सेज पैसिव का बिल्कुल इट्स अ बिग ट्रेंड एंड इट इज कमिंग इन बिकॉज ऑफ because managers are unable to outperform theek okay. the market where i spent last 15 years which is saudi a lot of discussion has happened on you know we should do passive and and in fact when i joined jadwa um, we had a passive fund we had an index we had two index funds gcc and saudi we closed those index funds there was no demand in it why because our active fund with a fees of 1.95% had an outperformers annualized outperformance for the last 15 years of 6.5% so if you are outperforming why would anyone be concerned about passive why would anyone want passive right so that is only happening in markets where active management is not adding value and which are the markets that active manager is not adding value where the number of participants how how does it work where when you have you know uh, 10 tahas and and 10 asims and 10 you know uh, imtiaz is a big big guy now we'll not count count him as an analyst but <laughs> but when you have those people doing research on the same stocks the the ability to find a winner goes down right that's only then the out active management uh, becomes difficult if that is not happening active management will keep on 
making you money and effective management will keep on making you money you you can launch as many passive funds they will never get uh, AUM so I think that that's that's the thing to think about uh, where in markets where where this is happening uh, it's because the act because the active guys are so good or they were so good that now all the mispricings have been they, they get you know, taken up immediately and, and hence you don't have the money to, to do that. Also when the scale is very big, you know, because if you have, you know, ten billion dollars to deploy, uh, you know, how, how are you going to do that in a, in a small market? So, so I think that those are also factors. Thank you very much. Some very interesting points. Uh, one remark and then two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Regarding the setting up of uh, entities outside, I think the main barrier is uh, the government regulations. Uh, I speak from experience because uh, uh, we wanted to send up a, set up a private equity Pakistan specific fund, but wanted to generate, uh, get, get, get some outside investors. But to, uh, for them to set it outside, even for initial setup costs, etc., you can't take money out. Uh, no matter if it's uh, in uh, less than a hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah. So as seed and all, so you you can't. It's, I mean, lately it has been the dollar issue. You can't even pay consultants outside, whatever alone setting up of uh, 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 big fund. So that's the remark. Uh, two questions on open banking. When when you have this customer data sharing, uh, right? How do you account for cyber security? So if that is leaked, uh, etc., whose responsibility it is? And also how much that depends on the maturity of market. So if you have 90% banked in the whole population kind of a thing, then probably is, uh, like in UK, that is the way to go. Would that be really something we should, where we, our country is, be thinking about at this juncture? Maybe it's 10 years later or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So that's one question. Second is, Sir, I will forget to answer it, if, if you allow, sorry. So, the first point, na, sir, main, what I was saying is, you are right, and, and I have come across this issue uh, where getting investors from outside or setting up entities outside and you know all the approvals related to that are, is, is a painful process. But what I am suggesting is, to set up operations outside for not to bring money outside. It is to get outside clients for outside strategies because you have the talent pool, right? So that, 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 uh, that is the thing. So the only thing required is that there will be some setup cost which will be spent outside. And I think that would require definitely approval that, you know, I want to set up an entity outside. You would probably require to take approval from SCCP or, or State Bank if your regulator is State Bank. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, look, many of the sponsors that we have of entities here have money outside. So I think it's, it, in my opinion, it's a matter of will and, and really uh, not probably being fully convinced that, you know, uh, the talent pool can, can deliver rather than, you know, not having you know, the regulatory hurdles for, for this part. What, you, for, for what you've said, yes, you're right, that, that, that has the regulatory aspects. The other thing you said about open banking is that uh, cyber security, bilkul, uh, one trend which I could have mentioned is a major, major issue, which is cyber security issue. And any time uh, anything on fintech happens, Cyber security, of course, goes hand in hand, and lack of it can create problems. We had yesterday unfortunate incident with with Bikea. So those type of things are are there, and and of course that's uh, that's why uh, open banking licenses are wherever they've been given, they've gone through a stringent uh, uh, evaluation process by the regulator. So it's it's almost. You know, in terms of the type of analysis, etc., due diligence that goes from a regulator is similar to, you know, if you're getting a proper full license. So it's 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 similar to that. Sorry, I, I hope I've answered. So, your second question, yeah. The second is when you look at these at a very generic global level. Uh, so these are uh, secular trends, right? Yeah. How much of Islamic finance industry 
Is it up to date in these country, countries <coughs> with these trends or is it lagging a few years behind? How, how, how does that comparison, Ji. broadly speaking, of course? Ji. Um, Islamic banking, I can talk about definitely the MENA region. Um, Islamic banking industry is, uh, is, is actually keeping pace with many of these things because uh, in, um, in Saudi specifically and broader MENA GCC, uh, there is a natural preference for, uh, for Sharia compliant investments, uh, much more than Pakistan. Uh, so it is a business case to have a Sharia compliant offering. Uh, many institutions only operate Sharia, not because of their you know, uh, belief in that, but because it's a good business proposition. Uh, for the last uh, you know, 13, 14 years, because after that I've not run that analysis, but I, I'm sure it holds still, a Sharia compliant equity index in Saudi outperformed conventional index. So there is no management involved in it, right? It's passive. Index out, Sharia index outperformed passive by almost 1% per annum. So a conventional fund starts off with a disadvantage, right? So, so there, that those are those are cases. So, uh, so because of all of these reasons, many of these fintechs, many of the banks, many of the asset managers in the region just do uh, you know Sharia. And as a result, all you know. For example, the probably from the incumbent banks in Saudi, the one which is the most advanced in terms of its technology infrastructure and what they're doing is is Raji Bank, which is which is a Sharia compliant, fully Sharia compliant bank. They have they have actually acquired a large software house right now. So so that, that that's the thought process that they they have. So very very focused on on technology. Okay, just, just a follow-up on that, your remark. I mean, if I am a conventional fund manager, nothing, nobody stops nobody, me from yes. investing in a Sharia-compliant stock, B right? So why am I underperforming? You are underperforming because uh, the big difference, and it, it can get into stock specific, but uh, big difference is that because of the preference of the general investing public towards Sharia, Sharia compliant, especially banks, tend to trade at a valuation which is higher than the conventional banks. And when I wear my analyst hat, I say this bank, Samba or, or NCB or SAB is cheaper than Raji. I should go in that bank instead of Raji. But the thing is Raji <laughs> keeps on outperforming and this bank keeps on underperforming. And that's where the challenge comes in. So naturally, actually, this uh, this choice itself leads to the underperformance. Jim, thank Tiaz, you very much. Most welcome, Imtiaz Bhai. Uh, Zaimi, just one question that you had: that the Harvard and other numbers there is a big shift to un illiquid investments. Jeez. Based on your experience, what are the factors? One is natural progression market, our hogi ambi us taraf chale jayenge, one is natural progress. But any variables that you see that can <coughs> prove to be the tipping point, that there will also be a cultural change here? There is a lot of difficult cultural change, but there are two or three things. One is that in the post-2008 interest rates, you have to pay for the traditional asset classes. In equities, there are very good returns, but on the fixed income and money market side, there are no returns on the fixed income and money market side. There was also that aspect. The other thing was that because some of these asset classes are actually levered exposures, right? Private equity is a levered exposure typically. Because some of these asset classes are actually levered exposures, right? Private equity is a levered exposure typically. Because of low rates, that becomes also actually more attractive. So, वो भी एक factor है. Plus, जो success थी private equity की, actually that preceded the global financial crisis. Actually, जो KKRs वगैरह के time थे, वो तो और 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 पहले का है. तो उस वक्त वो बहुत एक nascent area था और वहाँ पे private equity did extremely well. वो एक benefit हुआ. एक और area which was interesting was infrastructure. वहाँ पे भी बहुत सारी इन्वेस्टमेंट्स हुई हैं क्योंकि वो यील जेनरेटिंग बहुत अच्छी थी 
हमारे केस में जो एक कैन एन आसिफ भाई कैन कैन प्रॉब्ली कॉमेंट ऑन दिस गिवन दैट ही हैज ए पी ई सेटअप आई थिंक द प्रॉब्लम कम्स वेयर बिजनेस ओनर्स आर नॉट ओपन टू हैविंग यू नो गेट लेटिंग गो ऑफ देयर बिजनेस एंड प्राइवेट इक्विटी में सबसे बड़ी चीज़ यही है कि आपको बाहर का बंदा चाहिए यूर सेलिंग पार्ट ऑफ योर बिजनेस but and that becomes a challenge and, and that i think you know we had similar issue in in saudi and and jadwa was uh, by far the most active pe manager in in saudi and we saw that change happening why because when the next generation comes of owners business owners usme ek to ye hota hai ki father ne business set up kiya then you have multiple uh, kids someone wants to run the business someone does not want to run the business the person who does not want to run the business wants cash out so wo ek natural ban jata hai plus they want institutionalization wo ek reason ban jata hai actually uh, one very important point for a good vibrant pe market is to have a very good capital uh, public market right because that's where the natural exit happens unfortunately wo hamare yahan pe kafi arse se nahi rahi hai तो वो वो भी एक इशू है जो कि हमारे यहाँ मिसिंग है ये कल्चरल चेंज है जो आई थिंक कल्चरल चेंज आ जाता है बिकॉज जब नेक्स्ट जनरेशन दो तीन जनरेशन आती हैं तो वो चीज़ें नज़र आ होनी शुरू हो जाती हैं जस्ट एक कमेंट मैं इसमें ऐड करूँ कि हमारे यहाँ जो भी हमने नंबर्स की बात की इ लिक्विड एसेट्स की या इ लिक्विड एसेट क्लासेस की तो ये प्राइमरी जो नंबर्स हैं हमारे वो रेगुलेटेड इंडस्ट्री के जी हमारे जो अनकन्वेंशनल फंड मैनेजर्स हैं या अनरेगुलेटेड मार्केट है हमारी उसमें अगर आप देखें तो इन लिक्विड एसिड क्लास की तरफ बहुत ज़्यादा रुझान है हमारे पास रियल एस्टेट एवरी थिंग इज रियल एस्टेट लॉट ऑफ फंड फ्लो टूवर्ड्स रियल एस्टेट प्राइवेट एक्विटी इन दी अनऑर्गेनाइज मार्केट इज़ वेरी हाई प्राइवेट डेट स्ट्रक्चर्स बहुत सारे आपको मिल जाएंगे आपको गोल्ड की तरफ इन्वेस्टमेंट्स बहुत मिल जाएंगी तो वो एक अनकन्वेंशनल मार्केट टू एक्सिस्ट वैलिड पॉइंट पॉइंट एंड एक्चुअली दैट मेक्स मोर केस फॉर ऑर्गेनाइज इंस्टीट्यूशन टू डिवेलप थिंग्स इन दैट स्पेस राइट बिकॉज ऑलरेडी यहाँ पे चीज अवेलेबल है थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सही साहब फॉर योर इंसाइटफुल प्रेजेंटेशन मे आई रिक्वेस्ट अ बिग राउंड ऑफ अपलॉज फॉर हेम thank you for all your positive direction that you have given to the industry leaders um before um, we commence end this uh, i think i'd like to invite mr asif qureshi to the stage um to distribute plaques to our mentors of the mentorship program isko hata le kya Mayor request Mr Muslim Raza and Mr Rizwan Khan please and last but not the least Mr Faraz Mandukta May I request Mr. Zahiruddin uh, Khalid sir please to come on the stage to receive his flag from us uh, sub. And lastly may I request all the board members who are here to please come on the stage. Roxana uh, sir Lisa we have to stay back. I think maybe we can all come for a group photograph. Pehle ek board ke sath there's nobody else.
May I request all, the, all of you to please come on the stage for a group photograph, there are only a few of us. Sajid Sab, Asim, Imtiaz Sab, Nizwan, Tahir Sab, Tariq Sab, all of you please, do I have to? Mubashir, Raza, Muslim. Misbah, good to have some diversity. diversity. Diversity in our pictures. Uh, Tariq Sab, Asad Sab, Asfar, Salman, Wazir Sab, Kobe. Thank you everyone, please join us for dinner.